You can share the screen, Bijal. Bijal, unmute yourself. Ah, uh, fine. But I can't mute and unmute people, right? No, I'm just going to make you the co-host. Just okay, fine. Yeah. Are we ready to go? Yes, please. Okay, awesome. A warm, warm good evening to all of you. And it's so lovely that we're already 70 participants on the dot. Bobby, that's thanks to your popularity, as you can see. Um, so we open the session this evening. Uh, I hand it over to Jayashree to welcome the guests. Thank you so much, Deepa. It is indeed an honor to be able to uh, welcome our guest for this session. Um, Robbie Clements, Robert Clements. I know you need no introduction, but yes, I think that is something that is there on the agenda. But personally, on behalf of Tangent India and the 41 Club of India, I would like to welcome you to our session. And we are really looking forward from all our behalf, looking forward to a fantastic session with you. And I understand this is going to be interactive. So um, I have a lot of questions waiting for you. Thank you so much for giving us your time, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Jayashree. Jogi, I request you to please uh, introduce uh, Robert Clements. Good afternoon, dear friends. It gives me great pleasure to introduce someone whose life, whose writing and public speaking skills have inspired many who have known him over the years. Robert Clements, or Bobby, as we all know him, perfectly fits the description of a writer when I first met him 36 years ago. You may disagree today because he's, uh, uh, he's not exactly what uh, I'm going to describe. Uh, Buffy Andrews describes a writer as one who sees the world differently. Every voice we hear, he says, every face we see, every hand we touch could become story fabric. And that is what it is for Bobby, story fabric. Acutely observant with a sense of humor that could take the best of us off guard, Bobby didn't start his career as a writer. He didn't even imagine that one day he'd be writing for a daily column that's read across the world in several languages that he would author a book and owe oh, so much more. Uh, Bobby at one time actually ran a successful uh, interiors business, but he loved writing and directing plays as a passion. Uh, can I just give me a moment, please? Yeah. As a passion. And as a pastime, I would say, and more of a de-stressor, you know, everyone knows businesses can be very stressful. And this is something which he did uh, in the evenings after work and when he got his friends together at his place and he was quite a strict director. I first discovered Bobby the playwright when he wrote and directed a play for the Round Table AGM held in Bombay in 1988-89. He then started his Bob's Banter in Table Talk and later became editor. Correct me later, Bobby, if I'm wrong. Well, Bobby, the, the writer, has come a long way. His column, Bob's Banter, is read. It graces the pages of over 60 newspapers and magazines across India. He has a daily column in the Khalid Times Dubai the Morning Star London, and in nearly every state in India, from the Statesman in Kolkata to the Kashmir Times in Kashmir to the Trinity Mirror in Chennai. 
Mumbai Kars have read his column in the Times of India, Asian Age, Free Press Journal, Lok Sata, Nagpur, Aurangabad and Nasik, Sakal Times Pune, Andaman Chronicle, and in the afternoon dispatch and courier when his column, Bob's Banter, took over Busy Bee's daily column after the death of Behram Contractor. He also has a column in the Examiner, Indian Currents, and Teenager Magazines. Bob Plutchby hai popularly known is the only Indian columnist whose articles appear daily in Bangladesh's most popular newspaper, The Independent, and also in the Pakistan Observer, Pakistan. His column is translated into Hindi, Urdu, and Punjabi every day and is published in the Punjab Kesri Punjab. The Hind Samachar into Urdu and the Jag Bani into Punjabi. Hold your breath. He has a daily estimated readership of over 6 million. That's quite something, isn't it? He's on the board of the Nagindas Khandwala College, Malad, and was also vice president of the Bible Society of India. Now, over the years, with all the writing that he was doing, he finally decided to uh, write a book. And uh, it takes a lot of guts first to write and then to publish uh, a book because uh, as someone has said, if Moses were alive today, he'd come down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and spend the next five years trying to get it published. So, but Bobby with his business acumen has not only spread his writing across the world, but he managed to get a good publisher, published his book and has been read across the country I know and I know in many parts of the world. And today, he hasn't allowed the pandemic, the lockdown to make a difference to his life because during this time, he has started running an online class, the Bob Spanters writing course. But I wouldn't like to stop here because, uh, you know, to write, to do a writing course, it means that you, are, you face people and you talk to them. And uh, Bobby was the quintessential writer, introverted, not willing to talk across to people. He was happy doing his own thing. But, or he may be a one-to-one, -one, but it's a very different thing talking, having a big audience. But over several years now, he's invited to various uh, fora, to Rotary clubs as a guest speaker and he speaks extremely well. He has run courses in public speaking. And as you know, today, he's not going to speak to us only about writing. He's going to speak about public speaking as well, because he really speaks well. From the shy writer, to, from the shy successful businessman, to the shy writer, to a, a really good public speaker, Bobby has come a long way. And of course, with his book, which he has really promoted so well. But that's not everything about Bobby. Bobby's sense of humor is something that could make uh, you, it could catch anybody, uh, you know, he, uh, you won't know how, what to say after he said something. I'm, I'm sure Bobby's going to comment something, if not in front of everybody else, but later when he talks to me about the errors in my speaking. But uh, that's the way Bobby is, his wit, is amazing and his wit, the range of his wit is from the subtle to the uh, angry, angry wit, yes, sarcasm, irony, and to in your face humor. He goes across the entire range. But that's not all about Bobby. He's a compassionate, caring human being. He and Lata, are there to hold your hand when you, when you need him. He's always by your side. I know it because we as a family have needed him so many times and I've seen him with his compassion with, and with Lata's compassion. They make a very good couple. She's an anesthesiologist as a medical person and Bobby as a writer, journalist, public speaker, and uh, so they really help people when they need it. Bobby is, he has the religious spiritual side to him, which comes through in his writing. 
all as well. His range of writing is amazing. And uh, that has been passed on by them to their two daughters, Varuna and Amrita. Varuna, they're both beautiful girls, not just outside, but inside. And uh, Varuna lives with her husband and twins in New York. And Amu, who got married just under two years ago, lives here in Mumbai. Recently, she moved very close to where Bobby stays. So uh, Bobby has the good fortune of having uh, her around. And she is a very caring young woman. She's a counselor and she's helped a lot of people with their emotional problems. With this Bobby, I present uh, Bobby Clements, Robert Clements, and request Bobby to speak to us. Clements. Uh, Jogi, can I add just one thing? Okay, on Republic Day, Bobby was presented with an award by the Maharashtra Cabinet Minister Nawab Malik for having um, an amazing readership in a newspaper columns. Thank you, so, Bijal. I'm sorry I missed that, Bobby. I think no, it was not in his resume. This is thanks to this is thanks to I'm Facebook. Aware of it. I'm aware of it. Thanks to Facebook that I'm aware of this. So, and we've touched, I think, hundred members today on our Zoom call. So I don't think we can take any more than this, Jeshri. Wow, so, that's Bob, amazing! Yes, Bobby, over to you. Bobby, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jogi. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I was so glad when uh, when Bijal uh, and Deepa told me that Jogi was going to introduce me, not just because you're the wife of one of my closest friends, the late uh, Rajan, but because, and this you may not know, I've actually mentioned you in my book, Dare. And I'd like to kickstart today's session in reading about it. It comes under the caption, Dare to make an ass of yourself. And I'd like to read just a little portion about Jogi. And it is so fortunate that it was Jogi who introduced me. This was not by design, this was by chance. But again, everything in chance is also by design. <clears throat> this is. Dare to make an ass of yourself. It was the wife of a late friend of mine, a good speaker, who told me about her first experience in public speaking. Bob, she said, I went up on stage after having memorized my speech, started off with a lot of gusto and confidence, and somewhere midway, saw the eyes of everyone looking up at me and went into a shell shock. Yogi. My tongue froze, my mind went blank, and I stood the next two minutes like a statue as my classmates giggled. And then I stepped off the stage in shame, vowing never to face an audience again. No. But as you see, she went up again and later taught others how to speak English and speak in front of a crowd. That's daring to make an ass of yourself, a dare you need to muster and master if you're going to become either a public speaker or a writer. And what better introduction from the very person I can use as an example right at the beginning. It's phenomenal how things just work out the way we want, well, the way it should be without us wanting to, without us putting in any effort into it. Thank you, Jogi, for this. Thank you, Jogi, for opening it. But dare to make an ass of yourself is something which, my dear friends, you need to be prepared to do, to be an ass, to go up in front, to write something, to put it up in public, to, for, 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 to be able to face ridicule and for people to say, what has he done? I still remember this instance when I was a judge at IIT and uh, there were a lot of people, or there were a lot of uh, colleges who had, contributed towards putting up plays. 
and I was a, I was a sole judge. I don't know what happened uh, for the, to the other judges, but I remember I was a sole judge. And as the plays were being put up, there was a lot of booing going on. And uh, that's normal. That's normal. And suddenly, the girls from another college somewhere in South Bombay went up and said that they're getting out. They, they were not interested in participating. And one by one, the other participants also said that they were not interested, that there was too much of booing. And I realized there were two things that one is that it's going to be an empty hall. And secondly, that I wouldn't have any work to do. So I, I asked for the mic and uh, I spoke and I said, face the booing throughout your life. Face the booing throughout your life. And then act in a way that you're able to still, still the booing that people do. And I talked to the audience and I said, also remember to clap and cheer so that you build somebody up just by being, just by being there for them. They went up, they acted those plays and they acted those plays with so much gusto. There was not a single boo after that. They learned to act in such a way that the booing stopped. And as you make an ass of yourself, as you think you're making an ass of yourself, still the booing with what you produce in your writing, what you produce in your speaking, you're there in public, everybody's going to see you, especially your peer group, especially your peer group. And maybe you won't get the support of the, your closest friends and other people around you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Face the booze and come out a winner. So remember that, that's your first point. I've always been a writer. Uh, I, I think that uh, that was my saving grace in school. I started writing uh, right from the time uh, I was in the third or fourth standard. I remember my school magazine had taken something which I had written. And uh, that my writing is what saved me from being called a dunce or a failure in school. I don't think they call them dunces anymore. They used to, my mother used to say that, Bob, if you, go, if you go on failing the way you're going to fail, they have this dunce cap, they'll put on your head and make you stand in a corner. I've never seen a dunce cap, but that memory is so vivid that I get scared even now about me sitting somewhere with a dunce cap. But teachers couldn't figure out how a guy who failed in maths, history, and geography, oops, and even science, managed to escape through trigonometry later and flunked in Hindi, st still could write and write well. So writing saved my school life. And I'm grateful for this gift for doing so. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what, I would have been sitting over here with that same cap on top of my head. Many years later, I read a book this is after becoming a writer and just like what Jogi said, I was a writer, I was a businessman, a bit shy. Uh, I don't know why I was shy, but uh, I was quite uh, uh, an introvert and didn't much care for meeting people. Many years later, I read this book on public speaking and I grew interested in it. Then a few months later, decided that the best way to hone this new skill, public speaking, here's a writer who's learned public speaking. I decided the best way to hone this new skill was to speak everywhere. And so as the editor of my Rotary magazine, this is about uh, 30, 35 years back, 32 years back, when Rajan and I were part of uh, Rotary and uh, Rajan helped a lot in taking me to all these places and giving me a lot of confidence. And I'm thankful to the late Rajan Mithil for doing so. And I, I, I had to bring out this Rotary magazine. And I decided that, and since we had to sell the, send this Rotary mag magazine all over Bombay, I decided that I'd slip a note saying that, uh, uh, saying I would also give a talk to, in all the clubs if they called me. And guess what I would give a talk on? public speaking. And they called me. I still remember the first calls. There were no mobiles those days. There was those old phones you lifted up. And there was this call from uh, a club in uh, Juhu. And this, this was a Mr. Raheja. 
And he called me and he said, I believe you're a public speaker. I had heard that silence was very good, uh, was very part of uh, speaking in public. So there was big silence as I listened to him. I had no words to say. And then he said, we would like you to come and speak at our club next Thursday. Is it possible? So I, I was going to jump onto the phone and say, yes, yes. Uh, but I still myself and I said, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll just check my diary to see <clears throat> whether I've got other engagements. Other people have called me. I'll call you back. And I called him back and I said, yes, I'm coming. I'll come to speak. And I went over there and I still remember I was so nervous uh, that I, when I walked into the hall, I tripped on a wire, I tripped on everything. And then I reached the podium, the lectern, and I started the speech and suddenly, Suddenly, there was a sense of confidence. But that was just the beginning. And public speaking became something I enjoyed. Both practicing it and teaching it. Soon, because of my newspaper columns, organizations started asking me to conduct writers' workshops. And I started doing so and also did a few for doctors of Velo Medical College and other well-known organizations. It was while I was doing these separate teaching workshops, that is writer's workshops and public speaking workshops, that I realized that there were huge similarities between the two. That what I was teaching in speaking was more or less what I was training writers to do. And then, came the author of this uh, uh, monkey bath, that is uh, Modi's monkey bath. And he and Modi and this author have come together and brought this book, which has sold about 9 million copies. I didn't know who he was, but he wrote to me and he said, uh, Bob, I've been reading your writings. Would you be, uh, would you like to co-author a book with me? I, I don't know who he, I didn't know who he was. So I just said, you write? And he sent back a note saying, yes, he sent back a smiley. He said, yes, I write. And he said, I'd like, you I'd like to see how you write a book. I've been reading your articles. I'd like to see how you write a book. And I said, uh, why don't you do one thing? Why don't you just send me a page of or, or, or a first, the first chapter of the book which you're planning to write? And I'll rewrite it for you. And so I did just that. He sent me the first chapter. And when I gave, uh, uh, sent it back to him, he called me back and he said, Bob, you put me into my book. What have you done? That's me. And that's when I realized that what I had done was put this life coach, this person who does so many speaking assignments all over. I put him right there into his chapter, making him sit on the desk, making him walk up and down the aisle, talk to the people, the corporate leaders and so on, who he's trying to train and talk to them. And all that was being done in the writing of that first chapter. All I did was make that book come alive. But in that, in that, I realized that writing and speaking are the same thing. That you can, you can, make, a, you can make a speaker to be able to be there right in your book. And you can also make that writer to be there in your speaking. And I realized both, uh, both are the same. What I discovered was exactly what history also showed. Before writing, there was only speaking, right? Before storybooks, there were only storytellers. It was the same thing using two different mediums that to convey thought, one had to speak. And one needed to convey the same thought. If one needed to convey the same thought, I mean, I mean, then <laughs> into a into a wider wider area, then one had to write. But it was the same thought that was being conveyed, and the same twenty six letters of the alphabet that were, that are being used that were being used. But a study of speech and writing soon showed that speech and writing started branching off. They went started going in different directions. While speech became more direct, writing became laborious, lengthy, 
stylistic, and each developed their own unique styles, but they were so totally different. But, and all of y'all have gone through that. We've all gone to school where we've read the tale of two cities. It was the, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times and so on and so forth. And you wonder when the tale is going to start and after three, four pages starts the story. And they were considered bestsellers and they're still considered classics. But if you ask the youth to read any of these uh, books, they think, come on, boring. And the world changed with the jet age people stopped having time like they once did and written speech started coming closer and closer to spoken speech till, to, till today both have more or less merged as one again again if you look into your whatsapp chat you realize that you've written the way you speak and i was talking to uh, Somebody who had done, who has done their masters in English. I had done my masters in English many years back. So, but I was talking to somebody who had done it very, very recently, and this and this person told me, "Do you know that when you studied in college, T. S. Eliot and so on were the were the classics, were the literature you studied. Today, what you write in WhatsApp is what is literature. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating." Today, what you write in WhatsApp, your messages is literature. How you write it is literature. And how you're actually say, uh, writing it is the way you're actually talking. In fact, we even call it chat. Have you ever realized we don't call it WhatsApp write? We call it chat. It's merged, it's become one. Coming back to uh, aspiring writers, Again, I tell those who want to write to practice, practice, practice. You know what writers say? They say, Bob, where do we practice? I mean, people write to me and say that we want to write like you. You got your newspapers to write, but where do we write? Where do we practice? And uh, you can't, you can tell a writer, okay, start, you know, get your piece of paper and start writing or get onto your computer and start typing. But what do writers want to do? And I, I, I think of this very humorous uh, incident, anecdote, which uh, I like mentioning about a writer, one of we writers, you know, who died and went up, uh, and, uh, went up uh, either to heaven or hell. And there he was given a chance, writer, huh? There he was given a chance whether to go to hell or to heaven. And he said, okay, fine. I'd like to go and check out both. They said, fine, today is viewing day. You can go and check both heaven and hell. And he went over with this angel and they went over to hell and they looked in there and they saw a hall full of writers all diligently writing something on a piece on pieces of paper. And he said, well, that looks good. I don't mind being over here. On top of it in hell, it was air conditioned. I mean, we all think of hell as a place where it's very hot and uh, fires all over, but it was air conditioned. He said, great. And then he said, let me see heaven. And uh, the angel to come up to heaven and showed him heaven. And in heaven, they were doing the same thing. They were all writing and light, writing quite laboriously. And it wasn't even air conditioned. And he said, this is heaven. And he said, uh, what's the difference? I mean, I most probably like to choose hell. And the angel said, in heaven, all the writers have ink in their pens. In hell, they don't have ink. And what, what does, what's the difference? The difference is that when we have ink in our pens, we have something that we can write about and which will be published. And the only thing that a writer wants is to be published. And, uh, uh, well, you can imagine whether it was air conditioned or not, you can imagine what the writer chose. Now, which part of what we communicate every day is published all the time? Because if, if I were to ask an aspiring writer, like all of you want to write, where do you think that you'll be published? Because after all, you don't want to write journals, do you? You don't want to put it into a diary. You want to be read, you want to be seen, you want to, you want to be uh, 
uh, reacted with. You want people to read you and say, yes, that was good or that was bad. I didn't like the third sentence or, or, or wow, you're a powerful writer. Which, where can we have these blank screens? Where can we have these newspapers? Where can we be published? I'd like to take that whole journey which I started with. All this can happen in our speaking. Every moment, every moment when we are speaking, we are publishing our thoughts. Whether it is to a little baby, whether it's to a little child, whether it's to a, uh, to a father or, or, or mother or husbands or wives, we are publishing our thoughts and telling it out. It could be anybody, it could be neighbors. It could, and all the time, we are trying to make a bad, good, or no impression. Every moment, every moment in your speaking is an opportunity to work on your writing and speaking skills. And I come down to this little sentence. If you want to write well, if you want to write well, speak well, speak well. There is no need to look for a newspaper. There is no need to look for a magazine. There is no need to look for a bulletin. Yes, ultimately you will get there. But if you want the practice sessions started, start with your speaking. So how do we speak well? And that is when I developed what I call the WPC method. What, I call it the WPC what and how method. It's very simple. I like to use acronyms in my uh, speech so that nobody will have to take notes and they can uh, remember what I've uh, spoken. So WPC just stands for watch how you speak. Watch what you speak and how you speak. Watch <clears throat> what you speak and how you speak. Start observing, start noticing, start, start uh, realizing how you've com been communicating till now. Start watching yourself. The best way also to improve writing is by looking at your present writing, isn't it? So the best way in which you be, uh, to look at the kind of words that you use and the kind of sentences that you've been using is to Observe what you've been using till now. And I'm not going to joke or make fun of the way we have been talking till now, but I'm going to say that once you start looking at your speech, you'll realize that change, that there's a big, big, big need for you to change it. That is the W of WPC, is to watch how you speak. The P is plan what you're going to say and how you're going to say. Plan what you're going to say and how you're going to say. It does sound a little uh, difficult when you think that how I'm going to plan what I'm going to say. You know, the best extempo speakers are not extempo speakers. It's just that they know exactly what the ending is right when they started at the beginning. They know exactly what they're going to say right with the first word and the first sentence that they have uttered. And how does it happen? It happens when you start planning what you're going to say. When you don't plan what you're going to say, you start becoming a big bore. And all of us are, are in, in stages in life. I'm sure there are, if there are youngsters over here, don't worry, you've got another 50 years to become a bore. But all of us are st in stages of our lives when we could tend to become bores to our family and other people. And if you've noticed what happens when you become boring is that you're starting with a particular sentence or a talk. And as you go along, you meander and you forget what you're going to say. And you say that, yes, as I was going over here down the road, yeah, and then uh, this, you know what happened? And this uh, thing, ah, uh, I must tell you about yesterday. It's not so bad, I'm exaggerating. But when you plan what you're going to say, people will come to listen to what you're, uh, what you're speaking. It's so important that you start planning 
how you're going to say it. And in a, little, in a few minutes, in a few moments, I'm going to come to, to, to what the plan is. So plan what you're going to say. And the C is change what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. And once you start doing this, start using conversation as the blank papers of your writer's book. Conversation. Have you realized? We're using words when we are writing and we're using words when we're speaking. All I'm saying is that we need to speak all the time, whether it's to people in front of us or to people on the phone. And we lift up our phone and when we talk, we can watch out the way we are trying to convey something. We decide that that could have been conveyed with better words in a better sentence. It also, also, in watching your voice, in watching your pitch, in watching the way you say it. Because writing also grabs those moments of slowness of speech and you get the same words when you're writing. Speaking and writing is so, so connected. And I'll tell you how. Many years back, my late mother brought me a book from New York. <clears throat> it was called Handbook for Storytellers. She said, Bob, you love telling a story. And here's a book which will tell you how to. Now, after thinking that you're a great storyteller, that's not a nice thing to hear, isn't it? But mothers are mothers, as you all know, and she meant well. She still thought that I didn't really know how to tell a story. So she gave me this book. She loved hearing me telling my little child, though my kids were, my daughters were, Kids those days were small. And I used to tell them, Lata, I'll remember this day. I used to say Barbie doll stories to them. Now the idea of any bedtime story is to put your children to sleep. But I got so engrossed in storytelling that my wife complained that you left them more wide-eyed than when they stepped sleepy into the bedroom. Can you imagine two wide awake children were a compliment to my storytelling skills. But it was there at the children's bedside that I learned the art of storytelling. And you can too, you can too, the WPC method, speak stories. Children love stories. Adults also love stories. And whether it's going, to, and also whether it's going to be a sales deal, whether it's putting your grandchild on your lap or, or putting your grandchild to sleep, there's nothing like a good story. Use picture words. Picture words. When you speak, it, you don't need to use Sashi Tharoor words. If you really look at, if you really listen to what Sashi Tharoor says, he doesn't use big or, 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 or words which, are, which he tries to impress. He communicates. But we always like, we know that he uses, he loves, he knows big words and we use some of his words. But you don't need to use such words because you have to use words which are actually pictures which ignite and explode and go into the minds of either a child or your customer or your husband and paint pictures. That's what words are. Picture words. You know, it's like saying, I had a, I had a tsunami of problems yesterday. How? How different from saying, I had a lot of problems yesterday. I had a tsunami of problems yesterday. And in the other person's mind will come that picture of a huge tsunami. I've been, we've, we've all gone through, we've heard of the tsunami which uh, went all, uh, in so many of our coasts. And we know what a tsunami is. And you can picture it. Use picture words. That's what words do. Secondly, don't speak too fast. And also don't speak too slowly. We are not reading slowly from a script. Speak in which you're not eating up the ends of your word, words. You know, some, some of us are so hungry that when uh, we're talking a sentence, we, leave, we start eating up the la last part of the sentence. We went over there and you know what happened. It's a lot of it is due to lack of confidence. We are not sure the other person wants to listen to what we're saying. But if we start finishing our sentences, we'll find that the other person 
is going to listen to what we say. So stop eating up the last part of your word. Pitch well. Many speak with too high a voice. Use your voice. You know, when you, when you listen to instruments in an orchestra, you'll realize that each of those instruments are actually trying to, to uh, are all part of some voice which they're trying to get the sound of. God has given us these lovely voices. And what happens in a talk is that we go into high pitch. We go, you know what happened? No, we don't know what to happen. We want to know what happened. No, we don't even want to know that. We want to know what happened. We don't need a low tone. We don't need a high tone. We need your normal tone. And when you do that, when you do that, you'll realize the same thing happens in a writing. You don't exaggerate by using big words. You don't pull yourself down by using uh, uh, by using uh, silly small words or language which uh, you think is childish, but you, you're yourself. So use your voice well. <clears throat> and uh, this, of course, is for people who are speakers. You know, use eye contact and use gestures. Use eye contact and use gestures. You know, the same thing happens when you're writing. <clears throat> A lot of us write. A lot of us write sometimes forgetting that we are writing for an audience. And the best way to remember that we're writing for an audience is by, is by realizing and looking at the audience in front of you, by looking at your re readers in front of you. When we think that we don't have readers, we start writing stuff which nobody's going to read. But when we jump across, when we jump across the other side and we're sitting over there and watching ourselves talking, we realize that, hey, that guy is boring. And who's that guy? Well, that's Bobby over there. <laughs> Bobby is boring. And Bobby didn't realize that he's boring till he jumped across and looked at himself and realized that he's a big bore. So do it very often. Jump across. Look at yourself. See what you're speaking. Do the same thing when you write. Get to the other side. Read your stuff and see whether, yes, am I communicating? Am I interesting? Will people read me? Imagine always that you're telling a child a story. I'm coming back to my Barbie doll days. Always imagine that you're telling a child a story. Always look to see whether people are wide-eyed, but people are listening to you. Is there a bit of boredom? Is somebody looking away? Has somebody yawned? I can't see the screen now, but I'm not sure whether any of y'all have yawned, but I hope not. Uh, but if anybody, these are the things that you look for, because these are, these are what tell you how interesting you are. And this also tells you what kind of a picture you're painting. You don't go to a, a art gallery and look at a painting and ha ha yawn at a Mona Lisa. No, you look at it, it's exquisitiveness and you say, wow. And the same thing, when a writer writes something, he's doing a Mona Lisa. And what I'd like now, so that we can become a little interactive, is to uh, have a poem uh, which Bijal will put on the screen. And I'd like anyone uh, to read it out. Uh, my good friend Prashant always likes to uh, uh, be by my side uh, physically, normally in a uh, gathering. I hope he's here. Is Prashant there? Yeah, yeah, very much. I'm there. Yeah, you you know this uh, poem, uh, Home They Brought a Warrior Dead, uh, Prashant. You know it by heart. I think you recited it once or two or uh, twice after three drinks uh, in one of our round table no, I, meetings. I don't remember a single poem, even with or without drinks. Okay. okay. Bobby, we'll... and you first have to give him three drinks. Okay. <laughs> can you all see the screen? Yes, I okay. can. Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Can we ask Srini otherwise from the 41ers to read it? Sure, sure. Yeah, I can read it. Yeah. Okay. okay. The poem the poem goes as who's Bobby, reading it, all? Read it, right? Yes, please. Yes. And now Prashant. Prashant, remember what I said. How are we going to read it? We're going to read it. So that all of us can get wide-eyed, like a story, like something's yeah. happening. Yeah? Right. 
Okay, the the title goes as the princess whom they brought her warrior dead by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Whom they brought her warrior dead, she nor swooned nor uttered cry. All her maidens watching said, she must weep or she will die. Then they praised him soft and low, called them worthy to be loved. To his friend and noblest foe, yet she neither spoke nor moved. Stole a maiden from her place, nightly to the warrior's step, took the face cloth from her face, yet she neither moved nor wept. Rose a nurse of ninety years, set his child upon her knee, like summer tempest came her tears. Sweet my child, I live for thee. Yes, Prashant, good. Now I know how you won Beechel. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, before I have somebody else reading it, I want you to imagine the scene. Prashant, that was a good job. Thank you. I want you to, I want you to imagine the scene. There's a dead body in the room. Home they brought her warrior dead. There's a dead body in the room. There are women weeping. Maybe even men sobbing because he was a warrior, a leader. People are moving. You know how a funeral is? It's terrible. People are moving softly, silently, noiselessly across the room. But in all this, a widow stares lifelessly at her dead husband. Now can you imagine the scene? That is the picture you need to portray to your listeners. We need to learn to use pictures in our voice to portray it. So now I want somebody else to read it. Having heard my words, not that Prashant did a bad job, but now I want you to imagine the scene. Bring out, bring out the scene. Bring out the sadness, the sorrow in that room through your voice. Let it come out. Who else, Bijal? Srini. Uh, any volunteers? Srini. Srini. Bobby, can I try? Yes, please, of course. I'm here. Can I? Yes, yes please. Yes, uh, Srini. Please stand here. Shall I begin? Please. Yes, yes. Home, they brought her warrior dead. She nor seen the uttered cry. All her maidens watching said, she must weep or she will die. Then they praised him soft and low called him worthy to be loved. Foolish friends and noblest foe, yet she neither spoke nor moved. Stole a maiden from her place, lightly to the warrior's death. Took the face lost from the face, yet she neither moved nor wept. Rose, uh, I can, yeah, I can see that bottom part. Yeah. Rose, a nurse of ninety years, set his child upon her knee. Like summer tempest came her tears. Sweet my child, I live for thee. Thank you, thank you, Srini. Yes, Bijal, you can take it off. See, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to go further into anybody else reading it, but have you noticed that both Prashant and Srini were able to use voice? Maybe some of y'all can even make it more poignant. Have you realized that through voice, we can paint pictures? Have you realized that we can Actually, uh, let's say that the poem was not in front of us. 
and we were t- we were supposed to uh, talk the scene out to somebody, and we said, "Whom they brought her warrior dead? She nor swooned nor uttered cry. All her maidens watching said, she must weep or she will die." And then you can use your voice to the last part as the tension is building up. Rose, a nurse of 90 years, put his child upon her knee like summer tempest. Came her tears, sweet my child, I live for thee. There's relief, there's triumph. There's ecstasy, there's joy. She has cried at last. Very often we come out of a movie saying, the book was better than the movie. Why do we say that? You mean those little letters in the alphabet were better than this great gigantic screen which showed pictures? No. What the author had made you imagine in your mind and was able to ignite in your mind was better than the what this producer was able to produce on screen. And this is what we need to use with words. We need to use words that paint pictures. We need to say it in a way that will will be able to get people to go into that. Wow, I love that. Become storytellers, both in your speaking and in your writing. Learn to do that. I want to, uh, we are running short uh, of time, so I'll just go into the WPC method because I want to leave you with that. And all of you are going to ask me, what is the P? What is planning? What do you mean by plan what we speak? What do you mean plan what we speak? Doesn't it sound a little manipulative when we have to plan that what we say? No, no, no. I don't mean manipulative. I don't mean being clever or cunning about what we say. What I mean is that we need to have a structure in how we are able to communicate with people. And whether it's writing, or whether it is uh, speaking, let us use this structure which I'm going to give you. Like I said, I use acronyms. And uh, here I'm going to use a picture for you. Uh, like Jogi said, uh, I, I, I started my career over here in uh, Bombay, not as a writer. Though I, I did want to get into uh, the newspaper, I'd ha- I did get a job in Indian Express as a trainee sub-editor, which my dad said, no, no, you either continue in business and don't get into that. <clears throat> but I came, but we got into, into interior designing, we got into civil contract work, and I would like to associate this talk today with me in the sense of my name, Bob. And if you remember, there's to be a cartoon a TV serial, which is to come a long time back called Bob the Builder. Do you remember that? Yes, it's still there. Yeah, lovely. So if you can remember Bob the Builder, just remember now what we're going to do. We are going to build the structure. (laughs) We're going to build the structure of a house, a simple house. You know what we used to draw in kindergarten? We're just going to do that. And I'm going to take that house and give it to you so that you'll go back with it and you'll keep it with you. Because whenever we say plan our writing, plan our speaking, we always ask, what do we mean by plan? the first thing that should come into your mind is that house. To remember, you can, you can always remember my name, Bob the Builder. And since it was a little bit part of my profession before, I think it'll come a little easier to your mind. The house. I must tell you, I mean, as an aside, that uh, this being a being an interior designer and being a civil contractor d- does have its funny moments. Once I was called to speak at St. Xavier's College and... Uh, uh, I was on the podium along with the principal <clears throat> some years back. And as I was getting ready to give my two penny bit, uh, he leans across, the principal leaned across and he said, uh, uh, Mr. Clemens? I said, yes, father. He said, uh, I know you. And I felt very bad. I felt very good because he must have read me in afternoon or read me, not in Punjab case, he must have read me somewhere else. And uh, I sort of looked at him and said, thank you, father. Thank you. Didn't you do our auditorium and all our thing? Yes, father. Yeah, the roof is leaking. I said, okay, father. Okay, father. It put a little bit of a dampener on my speech, but that's how my old profession of Bob the Builder follows me all over. Even now, when I go to make speeches, 
Our roof is leaking. Our walls are crumbling. The paint is peeling off. So remember, all this is just for you to remember the house of the builder. What is the first thing that, first part of your mind that comes to play when you talk about a house? Strong foundation. Yes, yes. Now, before the foundation, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to say that it's a thought which is in your mind of how, like Prashant. Prashant has a house in Andheri West. We had a lot of parties there, lovely place, wonderful place. Some of our beautiful moments have been over there. But your dad built that house, Prashant. And I think when he built that house many, many years back, he did think of you all staying on the first floor. Or, aren't you on the second floor or first floor? Second. 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 second floor, both of them staying, your mom and dad uh, staying on the first floor. And uh, ground, floor. ground floor. So there was a there was a thought that went into the house right at the beginning, and after that, after that, he had to envision that if he's going to put two bedrooms on top, and he's going to put one bedroom below, and he's going to have a, 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 a that huge veranda which you have for for all of us to have gathered for doing all these things, he needed to have a foundation which would take all that. So before, when, after the thought, after the thought of what he had, he had to make a foundation which would be able to bear the whole house on it. And, and most of us, most of us, when we write a story or when we plan a speech, we do not make a foundation, which means we do not have a plot. Most of us will start with a thought and we think that our words, whether it's writing with a hand or speaking with a mouth, that our words will carry us on. Oh yes, they carry us, carry you on into the next sentence and the next and next, and nobody knows what you're saying. But when you know the foundation, the crystallizing, the, the, the seed of what the whole house is going to be, then the thought, the foundation, Makes sense. Oh, yeah, no, the foundation makes sense when it when it crystallizes, it crystallizes your thought, and the whole of what is going to happen next in your speech is there right at the beginning. That is the plan, your foundation, your plot. And most of us, when we start writing. We do not have a plot in our mind because we haven't envisaged the whole article. So remember this, you have to know what the whole story is going to be. You have to know what the whole house is going to be when you make the foundation, right? If you make a weak foundation and you think later that you can make a stronger house and a, a, a three-story house or a five-story house is going to come crashing down. So the foundation or your plot is the most important part of your house. After you made your foundation, which is the plot, which is the plan, you make your walls. What goes straight up? You make your walls. Now, do you make your walls right on top of the foundation or does Prashant go to his neighbor's place and starts making the, his house over there? Neighbor is nice. Yes, I know your neighbor. So, so we are not talking of Prashant, we're talking of normal people like us. We build our walls right on top of the foundation, don't we? We build it straight up. And that is so important when it comes to your story and what you're going to say. It has to be on the plot or the foundation of your original thinking. And it, the walls go straight up. And your walls are, is the story unfolding. Your walls is your speech taking off, your communication. And after the walls, I'm being very, very quick in this because I'm I don't want to be laborious and fight. I'm fighting for time. After the walls comes your roof. Your roof, which keeps you from the leakage, your roof, which keeps you from the sun, your roof, which keeps you from all the elements of nature or from anything falling on you, or maybe the three-story house next to you looking down to see what Bijal and Prashant are doing. The, the roof shields you from everything. Now, what is the roof? The roof of your story is the research that you do 
which could be anything. If you're writing about elephants, you're not going to talk about uh, five feet, five footed elephants. You're not going to talk about how many claw, uh, how, how their feet are. You're not going to talk about paws. You're going, not, you're going to be specific. You need to have to done research in any story, in any talk which you do. And that is the roof. Keep that in mind. In anything that you write or speak, keep the picture of the house, the foundation, which is the plot, the walls going straight up, your roof, which is the research which you've done onto, or on your subject. And then, and then, what do you have inside? And then you bring the carpenter and you make furniture. And what kind of furniture do you, do, do you put inside the house? Do you make huge museum pieces? you know, which go from one wall to the other, or it looks so good in the house that when visitors come, they sit quietly at a side and say, no, no, we won't let, we won't touch it. It might fall and break. We're not sure that the polish will come off. Or furniture, which is cumbersome. That furniture are the words which you use inside. Inside the home, inside the house, inside your speech, inside your story. The words which you use is the furniture. And you know, you all have seen sitting rooms in which there is furniture which doesn't sort of, I, I mean, I was an interior designer. So I sort of uh, have this uh, fascination for furniture and how, how it must fit into a home. You've seen, you've seen good furniture maybe in somebody else's house and then you take it into your sitting room, it doesn't go. It doesn't go because the kind of windows that you have, the kind of friendliness that you have, the kind of comfortable people that you are, doesn't go with this piece of furniture which went over there in the other person's house. So the words which you use are the words which are comfortable. Your pieces of furniture have to be comfortable words which are inside over there. Then remember that. After the furniture, what do we have? Who lives in the house? Who lives in the house? People, isn't it? People live in the house. And with the people comes emotions. With the people comes love and anger and hate and fighting and goodness and emotions and passion. And every speech that you do can be as straight, as blank as a Xerox sheet, or it can be as enlightening, enlightening and alive, like using voice or like a Losing uh, like a book, which in which you say it was better than the movie. All the people over there inside that house is the passion and the enthusiasm that you need to make your story alive, to make your talk alive. That's the people who are going around. And with the people, now I know there might not be dog lovers over here, but just behind this door, there's a there's a huge German shepherd, or rather he was huge, he's 14 years old. Yes, Jogi, you haven't seen him in the last one year, but he's, he's uh, Jeff has gone a little smaller. But a lot, of like, a lot of us like having pets. And what are these pets which go around? You know, you go to a house and you feel so comfortable because there's this little, there's a dog which comes and it smells you. There's a cat which comes and sits on a cushion over there. There's some people have, different other kinds of pets there'll be a parrot which is in a, is in the other room which is going on uh, maybe repeating something but the but the pets add to something what does it add to it adds to friendliness and what is the pets in an article or a story or our talk our pets are those little jokes these anecdotes the little mas masala the spices that we put into any of our articles or stories or talks so Remember the pets, remember the people, remember the walls, the roof, and then come down finally. Don't forget the foundation because the foundation, the plot is when all this has been created. It follows each other and this was created. And finally, what is outside that attracts people to that house? It's the garden. It's the windows, it's the kind of doors you use, the garden over there, the plants, the flowers. They tell, they tell people seductively, come in, we are comfortable, we are good people. Now you can't have the husband and wife peeping out of the window and saying, hey, come in over here, we're good people, come, we want visitors. 
No, but the idea of every home is for people to come in and enjoy themselves. Unless, of course, you build a prison. That's different. But otherwise, you make a garden which invites. And what is the invitation that you can do in your, in, in your, in your article or your speech? It's the curiosity factor. So many of you all are advertising. What is that which attracts us from reading a newspaper into moving and looking at your ad over there? After all, everybody buys a newspaper not to read ads, do we? We buy a newspaper to read the news. I write a column and in the column, I have to fight against rape and murder and uh, people in jail and accidents and floods. And I would, I would automatically want to go to all these things. But I, I have to make my article, my title, my first sentence so interesting that like the garden of the house, I call and attract people into my column to be read every day. Somebody put off the mic, it's uh, disturbing. And that is important. That is important. Your garden, your garden, which you have, is the curiosity, the attractiveness of your first sentence, your first paragraph, the cover of your book, the way you start your talk at the beginning. That keeps people, you've, you won them, you won 50% of their interest. So picture the house, keep it in your mind, and uh, Bob the Builder would like to leave you with that. And finally, before I leave you with Vigil, uh, 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 we are fighting for time, right? If I'm not mistaken, or do no, I have? You have five minutes more. You can okay, I've got five minutes quite more. Interesting. Oh, wonderful. I would like to leave you with five P's of writing and speaking that give you the three C's of, uh, of power, of power. And the first P is to be able to perceive yourself a writer. It's so important that you have a dream which, to which, which you can go towards. It's so important that you can see yourself on a podium or lectern or even in a Zoom call talking to people. Something I used to do before when I started speaking was to go to the place where I was going to speak the next day and I would go the day before and I would go to the same place and I would just stand over there and visualize myself speaking. And it made a lot of difference. It helped me a lot. It took away a lot of my, uh, it gave me a lot of confidence because mm -hmm. the next day, I, next day I was on familiar ground. I was on the same podium, which I was there yesterday. And I had sp stood over there yesterday and I felt good. So in the same way, in your mind, perceive yourself a speaker, perceive yourself a writer, see the book that you've written, see the book that you've written. It's so important, it's so good to see the book before you've written it or the speech before you've given it. The second, and this I'd like to bring what I talked about right about at the beginning, persist. The second P is persist. Just because a speaker was booed, just because you as an orator, went quiet. Just because you as a driver, learner driver, got hit by somebody or you hit some uh, lamppost or something, that doesn't mean you get, don't get behind the steering wheel again and drive. Persist, continue doing it, continue doing it. In all aspects of life, it doesn't have to be just speaking and writing. It can be in anything that you do. If you've had a problem the first time, persist and get onto it again, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And the third, the third P is to practice. And I always call it the third and the fourth and the fifth P, but to practice and practice and practice. Because when we think that we can one day finally go on uh, behind a lectern and start talking, and that day it will come automatically. It'll be a miracle. Wow, it's going to happen. No, start with small groups. Start with your group of friends. Start making your voice louder. Start being heard. Start finishing your sentences. It's not going to be easy because till then they might have thought you're a shy person. What's this person trying to talk now? There'll be people who'll slam you, who'll make you shut up. It doesn't matter. With humility, carry on. Practice. And the fourth P is prayer. I believe in it fully. 
all what I've talked to you just now has not come out to the internet. It's come out of for me. It's been my morning walks. When I walk in the morning, I talk and I I I I, I talk and I pray, I, I talk in my prayer and I said, today I have a class. I need an idea in which I'll be able to get it across to them. I need an idea for my article. I need an idea which will not be thrown out by a newspaper. And linking yourself, or uh, like I say, yielding to a higher power is so effective. That's the fourth P. And the fifth P is to participate. Take part in groups. Take part in activities in which you can speak or you can write. Those are the five Ps. And what does those five Ps give? The five Ps give the three Cs of being able to convince people to be able to control the people and their behavior and to bring about a change. To bring about a change. Finally, we want to change people with our speaking and our writing. We, we are not here to impress. If I had a few more minutes uh, to have been able to talk, I would have told you how my writing started and how initially it was my whole idea to impress people of having my byline <laughs> under the paper or under my column. And suddenly I found that who mattered to me were my readers and my readers wanted the truth. And I realized that I needed to be mm -hmm. able to communicate with my readers to be able to change them. And the three C's are convince control and change. And I would like to, Bijal and uh, Deepa and Jayashree, just leave all of y'all with this little poem, which has stood me through my years from, as my book says, a shy, a shy, skinny, sickly boy. That was me. And this poem I wrote in red ink, because that time we didn't have the rocks and so on. We had cyclostyling. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Or do I come from the age of dinosaurs? But anyway, we, we have- are very much part of the same <laughs> genre. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wrote this poem and I stuck it next to my bed and I read it every day. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm sure you've heard it before, but I'm going to read it to you and I'm going to leave you with this poem. And the poem is, if you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you lose, you're lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Because my dear friends, life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man or woman who wins is the one who thinks he or she can. And with that, I'd like to leave these thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Bobby. This is very close to what Rhonda Bryan speaks about in The Secret. This is what you visualize and what you think you will be able to achieve in life. Um, we are open to uh, 20, 20 minutes of um, question answers. So if anybody has any questions to ask Bobby, he, has, he will be there to answer them. Like Bobby, the, first I, question, um, what is more important, content or delivery? Yes. Uh, having been a Rotarian before, we had two brothers. We had two brothers. One was very good at delivery, and he could, he could talk even at, at, at the drop of a hat, he could start speaking. And the other brother was so, uh, maybe he was educated uh, in a different state. He was not... He was not uh, so good in delivery. But after a year, and both of them became district governors, after a year, and if you ask people who they remember, it's the brother who was not good at delivery, but who had... You get away with your delivery, but you're remembered for your content. And when you're able to do both, Bijal, 
when you're able to bring both into play, then you've got yourself a bestseller. Anybody has questions? Yes, I have question. Yes, Bob, uh, you spoke about the house and you said that the foundation and the walls. So, unfortunately, I missed the walls part. What is the wall part of your project? Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I mean, I, it's a it's a question in which I normally would have expanded in my class, in my writer's class. See, the, uh, most of us, most of us have a plot which we keep, and then, as we start writing, our writing starts leading us away from our plot which we started off with. We start moving away because because it always starts with a joke which we say and then the joke leaves us to an explanation of the joke then it goes into another inc incident and before you know what happens you have been led away with your pen and with your thoughts away from the original plot so the walls when i say walls that even if you have a little balcony even if you have a little uh, statue of what, what do they have in vt station those gargoyles yeah, those gargoyles. Even if you have all these little things all over, that's fine. But keep your wall straight, going going up straight, because the reader otherwise will be lost. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask if you? I can ask a question. Yeah, Jesh. Anybody else has then? No, Jesh, carry on, carry on. <clears throat> okay. I have been forever searching for good, strong content writers. <laughs> Now, there are two kinds of copies that they say. One is the short copy and the long copy, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there are two kinds of content writers, one who are writing for the main domains and one who are writing digital. What is this difference? I mean, I've not been able to find that kind of a true copywriter because what is that difference? Because here I'm not writing for something that's my own passion, but I'm writing for a client, right? So what is it that I need to have to be able to find, to be a good writer or a good content developer? And what is it that I, as somebody who's searching for such a kind of writer, need to look for? What's happened over here in India is that we have become so good technically in creating a website. We have become tech technically very good with gimmicks. We can have flashing of, or we can have music coming over there. We can have all sorts of colors going around our website. All Everything is good, even good at fonts. We're even not too bad at fonts, though fonts, we're still not reached there because fonts are very important. But when it comes to writing the content, it's the same as writing a book or an article and the formula is the same. But unfortunately, we leave it to the website de designer and tell him that, yes, we will be sending some content. You just put it over there. No, mm -hmm. what we have to put over there is exactly like what I said. It has to be a garden which attracts. It has to be a first paragraph, mm -hmm. a first line which draws people to your website. And it follows the same aspects of storytelling. Okay. Can I come? Uh, Jay Jayashree, uh, but Come with me. I mean, if you didn't get it, or shall we talk? Uh, we'll talk later. Yeah, about I'll it. reach out yeah. to you separately on this. Yes, sure, because sure. Uh, okay. it's a big thing for me. Yeah. Sure. Ashan. Yeah, Bobby. I've been uh, writing a bit on WhatsApp and Facebook, and uh, I have a pretty good bunch of followers. When it comes to social media writing and Facebook and WhatsApp writing, I've realized that the attention span is getting shorter and shorter. The captivating span of time that you can hold a viewer, a reader, is getting shorter and shorter thanks to social media. In this scenario, how do you apply all that you spoke to about us in the changing world of short span social media? That's the question. Prashant, I would say we have to use the same thing more, more concisely. You know, one of, the, one of the exercises which we do in our class is I tell somebody, uh, or rather, writers come to me and tell me that you've asked us to write an article of 500 words. You won't believe it, Bob, I can write 1,000 words. I said, I tell them, all of us can write 1,000 words. But can you take those 500 words and be able to write it in 50? That is the challenge, yes.
a few, a few years ago, a young copywriter uh, never tried to impress people with the profundity of a thought or by obscurity of a language. Whatever has been thoroughly thought through can be stated simply. Or, Prashant, I'll uh, answer. I'm trying to look for the battleship one. Just give me a moment. Cicero says, if I had more time, I would have written more briefly. Okay. This where's the battleship one? That was so good. Okay, what bothers you most about the people you interview? Someone asked uh, Phil Donahue, the TV guy. Without hesitation, he answered, people who float a battleship of words when they just have, a, when they could have done it with a tugboat of thoughts. People who float a battleship of words when they could have done it with a tugboat, a small boat of thoughts. So Prashant, when, when, you, when you want to connect with people and you, when you want to use less thoughts, I think that's the correct way of doing it. But what you need to do is to be able to get those words, get those words. And like I said, paint pictures, paint, instead of painting a full wall, put a painting, put a small photograph and get the same effect. Thank you. Thanks. Isn't that different from simple writing? If I'm painting a picture, I'm being dramatic. Yeah. Right? If yes. Uh, can you say it again, please? So if I am painting a picture, I'm being dramatic, right? So is that important to be every time or just simple words? To be I would say, uh, let's don't mix simple words uh, with... Uh, small words. When I use simple language to paint big pictures, use become dramatic, become dramatic in, in, in the picture that in the imagery that you want to portray to the people. But if you're trying to use it by using a big word, you can you can lose the viewer or the loser or the reader because he doesn't understand what you're saying. But it's the imagery that counts more than the kind of impressive words that you're trying to use. It's the imagery that you create. It's, it's the word, it's, it's the picture that you create, which is more important than the big word that you use. Yeah. I remember Bobby a few years back, you had helped my daughter Asta write an article for one of her submissions for her um, when she was looking for college applications and she had to write on the Mumbai terror attack. And Jeshi, this is uh, like, you know, I'm trying to talk on behalf of Bobby. And at that point, when she was writing about the Mumbai terror attacks on the Taj Mahal, um, Bobby told Astha to write her entire article um, from the point of view of Gateway of India. And it's the Gateway of India seeing and observing the terror attacks which happened at on the Taj Mahal and what he saw and what he felt and it was it was the entire story instead of thinking this is what happened and these people came by boat and this is what happened at the Taj it was the gateway of India talking and narrating the entire story and um, her teachers found that entire uh, the way she had narrated and person? written that entire article. Uh, they she got she got very good marks on that. So thanks, Bobby, for that. Yeah, uh, Jayshree, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Uh, it, it, the, the drama, yeah, the drama can be from painting a painting and imagery, which which is so different from what people would have thought of otherwise. Thanks, Bobby. Very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you. Bobby, another thing which I have always felt is like if it came to a rehearsed speech or a prepared speech or something, 
I am like pretty good at, you know, going and talking in front of an audience or something. But if I have to speak extempore or if suppose like suddenly somebody tells me, okay, you know, speak something and without any preparation, then I get pretty anxious and I say, no, I will not talk extempore because I don't know, I get um, stage fright or fear. So I, I, how do you deal with that? I'll tell you a very simple uh, way to do, deal with it. It's the way I do things. You know, we Christians have this uh, con concept that when we're standing together or we go to church, somebody will suddenly say, uh, Bobby, will you pray today? Pray. And it's sometimes it's some person who's just been asked to pray today. He hasn't had uh, time to be able to think about what he's going to say. But what I do, what I do, though it's a new place or it's so on, in my mind, I'll tell myself, be prepared. Be prepared. You might be called up to speak. You might be called up to pray. You know, just in your work out a plan. There's only a 5% chance or sometimes less that you might go up over there. But once you practice doing this, of just working out a plan of being the next speaker, of keeping that plan, sometimes there'll be plans, 90% of the plans will be thrown into the dustbin of your mind. But I keep preparing that I will be asked some, to say a few words or to pray. And it's helped me immensely. And after that, people say, how did you do that just like that? Oh, well, it wasn't just like that. <laughs> a lot. The Bobby Clemens went and made a plan in his mind. And it was, it's practice. And it helps a lot. Uh, Bobby, I have a question. Uh, going back to all those years, you know, I think I, it wasn't even school or college. It was my work place where this uh, speech uh, thing happened, you know, where I was... Uh, I froze, literally. Now, I face this problem on Zoom. You know, I've, I'm prepared, I've got everything ready, but something goes wrong even while I'm speaking now is that I find it very difficult to communicate on Zoom. How does one get over that? You know, my, uh, my, uh, you know Varuna, my daughter, yes, she, was, uh, she, was, uh, she was the anchor for Bloomberg. And uh, when, you, when, when she went into this room, I had, I had more or less trained her I still remember those training sessions. Wow, those were doubly days in which she would she would allow herself to go through poetry, to go through debates again and again and again because she wanted to be a good speaker. And then in that room in Bloomberg, where she had to go over there and talk to just a screen. And all I told her was, imagine beyond that, there's 10,000 people listening to you like you're on our stage and there's darkness down there. You can't see them. Look at them and imagine that they are there. So once we start doing that, and it's difficult even for me, Jogi, right at the moment, because the image I'm seeing in front of me is myself. Exactly. Yeah. But I know that I'm not talking to myself. My imagination tells me that I'm talking to so many people. And once you're able to do that, we get over the Zoom problem. I understand what you're saying, but we have to use our imagination that we're not talking. The image over there, of, of course, we can put it on the gallery screen and talk to everybody else. But when a recording is going on, it's, uh, I have to put my image there so that the recording will, will be able to be used later. But I always realize that I'm not talking to myself. It's like the subtitles underneath a, a movie and you don't want the subtitles but the, your, the person next to you wants the subtitles because he or she doesn't understand after some time you tell your mind don't read the subtitles don't i know they're very it. distracting absolutely tell your mind my mind is very powerful tell your mind don't read it it's okay look at the movie listen to the conversation same thing we have to do here Bobby, can you tell us something Bobby. about the workshops that you are conducting? I would be interested in joining them. How long is it? What is the duration? See, the, uh, I started these workshops about four or five months back. Uh, I call it the Bob's Banter Writers and Speakers course, and it goes for a, a month. Uh, we use Fridays and Saturdays, uh, 6 to 8 o'clock for, for the full month. So it's two, uh, four, uh, two hours 
for Friday, two hours for Saturday. And in eight hours, in eight, uh, not sorry, sorry, it's in uh, two to four, 16 hours, mm -hmm. 16 hours at the end of 16 hours, each of them has 10 chapters of a book wow. ready. Each of them has 10 chapters of a book, uh, plots ready, one chapter fully finished, and they're on the way to become writers. So I'm, and I'm not saying that it's a grueling, intensive course. No, I try to bring this aspect of speaking and writing and this aspect of the home of the house into it. And we follow it. We follow it. And we, we, we bring the walls back into shape. We bring the roof. There's no research done over here. We remind the other, uh, other person who's written and all of us judge are uh, the jury for the person who's doing his piece yeah. that day. And in the end, each one of them becomes writers. So that's the course uh, uh, we have been able to now bring out. Uh, this is the 67th uh, number of people that are in my course, <clears throat> 67 this month, just 25 people per course. But uh, I'm very happy with uh, what we are being able to produce today. I'm very happy. Uh, tell me, Bobby, uh, do you plan to have a real Can somebody time put that time? mic off, please, whoever it is? Uh, yeah, Jogi, I can't hear you. Uh, do you. Do you plan to have a real face-to-face -face course sometime in future? Jogi, today, in fact, in, in, in today's audience, I have people who are part of my course. JP, you're there? Nothing. I'm asking is by now my eyes are no, because I can't I'm handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One I'm minute, JP. One minute. JP is here. JP is I'm there. From, yeah. Yes, JP is here. Uh, that uh, the voice I know. That is Shama from Punjab. JP from London. Uh, I'm from Delhi. Tovi from Tovi from Nagaland. Tovi from Nagaland. All of them. And I wouldn't now want to go back to a face-to-face -face thing, of uh, course, because. This is wonderful. Zoom, I believe, has come to stay because we have been able to interact now across the world and make it into one room, one platform. I wouldn't want to give this up. So please you share could the do details. both a combination, you know, like some courses for people who are willing to uh, do a real thing and for others who want to do a Zoom, maybe you could do both. Yeah, so please I've... share your contact details. Yeah, um, my, cont uh, uh, my number, my number is nine nine eight nine two five seven two eight eight three. I think Bijal will put it up somewhere. Yeah, I'll put it up. I'll put it up. Yeah, nine uh -huh. eight nine two five seven two eight eight three. I had a question. Yes. And um, I I wanted to know. You know, we talk about practicing speech, and we always do that. Um, I practice in front of a mirror as well, uh, often enough. And I was wondering, how do you, when you're actually delivering the speech, how do you maintain that spontaneity or make it seem still natural once you've practiced so much? I find that a challenge sometimes. What happens when you do a one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face speech with one person? You're, you're able to, you're able to use his or her reactions to gauge how they're reacting to it. And in that same way, you are able to speak, right? That is correct. Okay. Now, in an audience, I'm, and I'm talking of a physical audience, in an audience, try to find three people in front of you. And okay. uh, generally, what my, the secret I, uh, uh, I would like to tell you is that I would come a little early for the meeting. And I would try to talk to three people and make friends with them. Okay. Then they would go and sit in different places, but they know you, you know their names. And I would then talk to one here, and then I would turn to this person, talk to that person, and turn to this person, talk. but I'm talking actually face to face. And what the rest of the people are saying <laughs> is my body language. Even, even if I'm not talking to each one of them, they are seeing my intensity of thought because I'm talking to one person's face. Just imagine I'm speaking to somebody over here and I'm being very, very vehement about some spot. You don't lose out on it. It's like a camera taking me at side angle. That's it's, not, it's not lost anything. So try to do that. 
if you can't come in early and follow this, what you do is look for a friendly face. Look for that person who's nodding, who's, who's shaking his head and saying, they, they, there will be people in the audience who are nodding, who are agreeing with you. Okay. Look at that person. You'll get another person here. You'll get a third person over here. And catch those people. Catch those people. And slowly you'll find that you'll get a fourth person there and a fifth person over there. And you talk to them. And you get, and you get over, you, 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 you'll realize that you're back to one-to-one. 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 Fair enough. Thank you. I must, I must tell you that uh, I taught my daughter when she was a little girl, I taught her this of being able to look at this person, look at this person and look at this person. And Jogi, I hope you don't mind what I'm going to mention now, because it's going to, I'm going to talk of my dear little girl, Muskan. But I know that evening after Runa had talked over there in the, the school, Muskan came home and she told me, Bobby uncle, what happened to Varuna? She went like this, and then she went like this, and then she <laughs> went like this, and throughout the thing. And then I had to call my daughter and say, when I said talk to one person, it doesn't mean shaking your head and talking like this. It means eye contact, talk. So remember that it's engaging. You have to engage with that person. Of course, she was. <laughs> Bobby, there is a Thank question which has come from Pooja. Pooja, yeah. would you like to ask the question? Yeah, I just wanted to know if that course, uh, the writing course is for only fictional writing or it... Uh... Any writing, okay. whether it's fictional, whether it's uh, a technical, whether it's content writing, any kind of writing. We have all sorts of writers uh, who come for the course. If we, last month, we had four doctors, four doctors who had come for the course. This month, we have... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, fathers, teachers, and so on who have come for the course. They're not writing books. They're just using the, the, the uh, they're just going to use storytelling in a way in which they can, in normal life. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bobby, yeah? My sure. question is, sorry, a repeat, I mean, second question from me. As a professor and when I'm addressing the youth, Okay, I find it that the maximum competition for us from the audience is from the mobile phone, which is in the hand. So how exactly can a writer, you know, get back, I mean, the speaker get back the attention of the audience versus a mobile phone? This is the dread of any teacher or any public speaker today. Absolutely, absolutely. I address a lot of schools and believe you me, if I know that is going to be ninth or 10th standard, I, it's the most difficult thing for me. But the first thing I do, may I know your name? I'm Shiba, Shiba Gomes, Dr. Shiba Gomes, to be exact. Ah, oh, Shiba, hi. 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 <laughs> One of the schools was your school, Godridge School. Yeah, I, had, I had recommended <laughs> you there too. Yes, I spoke over there. But something that I do, Shiba, is, uh, is to move down from my podium, move mm -hmm. down from my platform, Get down into the group, into the children, walk mm. up and down, talk to the individuals. And then I found I'm engaging with uh, the, the children. Mm. This I found is the most effective when it comes to children. If you're going to be, you know, that 20 feet away and on top of a mm. stage, you've lost them. Even if the mm. school has said no mobiles allowed, it doesn't work. They are not interested. They'll be looking here. They'll be looking everywhere. You walk mm. among them, mm. talk to them. Because I did this, I started doing this and not with school children. I started doing it with Stella Maris College, Madras. They'd call me to speak. And I, and, and I found that I needed to engage with them. And I started walking uh, among the, uh, in the aisles and talking to them. My wife says it's because they were all pretty girls. No, it wasn't. It was the only way that I could talk to them. And it worked. Okay. Thank you. I will keep uh, sure. Robert, uh, I have a question. Uh, can you just share a few quick thoughts on fair and balanced writing and incorporating humor, especially in the times we are living today? So how bold is bold for writing? Yes, I would say that you use the word balance. Yes, I did. Yeah, I would say that in anything that we do, because writing is powerful. Uh, something I do in the first class that we do uh, for the writers close 
is to tell P is to teach the word empty, in which I ask the writers, all of us, to empty your minds. And I use the E M P T Y of empty uh, again, my acronym, in which every bit of hurts, hurts and injuries and whatever has happened to them is empty. I right? tell them to write it on a slip of paper. And after, and why do I do that? I ask them to tear the papers afterwards. And why do I do it? I do it because when we go with our own baggage into of the field of the powerful field of writing, then that baggage which we have influences our thought. Again, I'm sticking to baggage, sticking to balance. Once we are, once the bag baggage has gone, we'll find that we are we are able to use our writing effectively without hurting people. And most of our most of the problems that are happening all over the country is when we hurt people's sentiments, not realizing that if we were in the same shoes, we would also be hurt. And I'll give you an instance. A couple of years back, I was given the column in Nagpur for the Lokmat paper. Now the Lokmat Times over there, that you know Nagpur is the RSS uh, headquarters. And the editor told me, he said, see, uh, we'd like you to do a weekly column over there, but uh, you being a Christian, will you be able to not attack the RSS? Is it okay? He said, because it's important for us. I said, okay, I thought about it. And I said that, is this my baggage in which anything which is non-Christian I attack? And I said, if that is my baggage, it's got to go. Yes, I'll write maybe thoughts which I've been brought on, my Christian thought, but I do not attack somebody. I do not attack his sentiments because to him or her, that's as important as what mine is. And my column is still there. My column is still there. Today, Sunday, ah, this morning it was there. So balance your writing. Don't use it as a weapon. Use it to be able to change people and do gently. Bobby, can I- Bobby, ask, I have a question. Can we call for the last question? I can, think. can we have yes. any any I gent have... any gent over here after this question? After, is there any man? Because I heard a lot of men's voices initially and then the women quieten them and I need to support them. I mean, I need to go back to them finally. I think Bobby, after this lady asks a question. Yeah. Done, yeah. done, done. <laughs> That's Sashikala, yeah? Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, Sashi, hi. hi. This is basically about the writer's course. Uh, what if you're not planning to write a book or you haven't the foggiest idea whether you'd ever write a book and you don't have any idea of any plot, but you're still curious. I'm, I want to, but I don't know whether there is a writer in me, to be very honest. Partially, there may be a speaker in me after listening to you today. I feel, okay, maybe I could give it a shot, but I don't know about a book. So is the course still for me? Yes, of course. The course is for everybody. Most people think that, uh, oh, it's for, it's for an author, it's for a writer, it's for, a, uh, it's for somebody who wants to make a profession of it. Yes, if you want to make a profession of it, you can continue and make a profession. But all of us, each one of us, each one of us need to get back to the power of telling a story because that is everyday life. Whether you're a corporate honcho or whatever you're doing, the power of being able to talk and tell a tale, to be able to write a tale, to be able to use words that will be able to change and be able to convince. That's what we teach. Thank you. For that, Sashikala, for that, yeah. there has to be a process you have to know the ending at the beginning. I go on telling my class, know yes. the ending, know the ending right at the beginning. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Can we have the last question, preferably from a gentleman, as Bobby says? <laughs> Bobby, could you tell us about how to handle the stage fright? Stage fright? <laughs> yes, stage fright. Who's this? This is this is Prakash Almeida from Versailles. Yes, Prakash. You know, when I used to have my group of actors on, on stage, and at some place after we've done the play the first time, and then we've done it, done it the second time, and the third time, my actors started getting complacent. You know, they say they, they had gone 
oh yeah, we can walk up anywhere and uh, we can act. And I used to tell them that as long as you're not scared, you're not going to act. Because when you're scared and when you go up there with a little bit of fear in you, you're going to bring out the best in you in your action. When you're overconfident, that's not acting. That's being slick. So if you've got stage flight, don't try to knock it off totally. Try to take off the edges. You know, there's enough and more techniques in which uh, you get into the character. You are, like I said, in public speaking, you look at the audience, you talk your lines to the audience. If you're scared of re remembering your lines, get the prompter always there. And that, this used to be what I used to do as an actor. I used to walk close to the prompter. Uh, and that used to be where, because like, my memory is terrible. Uh, and the prompter would tell me uh, my lines and I would then repeat it. But a little bit of stage fright, Prakash, keep it, keep it. If I didn't walk today, to, uh, today, even today, coming to your group over here, there was a part of me which is a little apprehensive, a little scared. And I'm glad about that. Because when you do that, two things happen. One is you try to get over it. And second, like I always say, you yield to the higher power. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Can I ask the last question? Uh, Yes, Vijan? Aleem. How are you? I'm fine, um, thank you. That Aleem is from Aleem. Bangalore. Uh, he's a 41er from Bangalore. What's his name? Aleem. Aleem. Area chairman. Yeah. Okay. Area chairman from Bangalore. Yeah, sure. Hi, Bobby. Uh, uh, my thinker in me is faster than a writer in me. I'm a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. I can think pretty fast, but the moment I take a pen and want to put, put it down, my thought processes don't match. Because I think mm. I'm very, very fast, but very, very slow at uh, putting it on the paper. Mm. What mm. is the advice you give us? And do you have any short courses like two hours, five hours, uh, something like that? Uh, something have you planned on those lines? Thank you, Bob. See, uh, Bob, the, well, most of us go through this thing when we, when we say that our thoughts are so fast that our, our writing is too slow for our thoughts which is why I brought in this thing of this uh, aspect of the house in which I say, think, don't put your pen to paper till you've thought out the whole story. And there are some a fallacy which happens in my class is that they start writing when they start the story. Ah, I've got an idea. Let me start. No, don't do that. Don't do that. 99% of we writers do that. Don't put your pen to paper. First, sit quietly. Imagine the whole story. Imagine the sequence, imagine what's happening, imagine the ending, then concisely put that down as your plot. Yes, he goes there, from there he walked up the hill, met somebody, and then they took a pail of water, and then what happened? Then he came tumbling down and crashed to the ground below. And when you've got that whole sequence in your mind, and you, that you put down, that's the plot. Once you've got the plot, your brain won't start working at that speed because it's already worked at that speed and told you the whole story, which you've got and brought it to a concise pressy writing type and brought it, kept it, caged it, and now start letting it out of the cage slowly and writing it and enjoy that writing. Enjoy the writing. Enjoy taking the part per person letting him pour his three JPs over here. He, he enthralled me once with his writing in which he said, she brought two cups filled with tea. Somebody else would have said she brought the tea. Enjoy the opening of the story because it's not going to go away. You captured it. You've got it in the plot. The foundation has been built. He asked Our, one more question. Do you have a, a, a small course of maybe two, three hours or something? Maybe we could take it on for tangent and for 41ers. Huh, Alim? Yes, would, Vijal, precisely. I would say that um, uh, I would say that even this one month's course is uh, is compact. No, but that is like that is a very Bobby. extensive one. I mean, he's no. talking about you know. Uh, 
a small thing on public speaking or something i Last i understood course. i understood where alim is coming from because like people who like reached area level or they have uh, reached a certain i mean like you know prayer chair, chair persons of the club and all and they need to address the members or they need to address people and uh, is there something by which you know we, you could develop something like that either for uh, tangent and for the 41ers and have a small group where you could address them for like you know teach them the do's and don'ts of you know how to start how to end mainly with vis-a-vis with uh, public speaking is that think, right uh, ali I, I, I was think... more keen on the writing. Speaking is a easier oh. job than writing. Okay, okay. Thank you I, very my much. bad, my bad, my bad. Right. But, okay, but but if I remember, and Deepa is over here, I can see her right in front of me. We used to have this going for so for quite some time, in which Deepa in four hours, right? Deepa, four hours. Yes, 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 Bobby. So, in in an afternoon from two to six, we would finish. Uh, we would finish public speaking, and. Yes, maybe give it some thought, but a two-day session, something like that. Yes. Right, where we could we could bring in writing and speaking. I'll I'll have to work it out, but we could bring a module like that way. It'll be quite, uh, but it'll be four hours, four hours, something like that, not just two hours, two hours. Yeah. And last, if I'm not very curious, how much do you charge for your one-month program or something like that? Just a thumb roll, if you are okay with it, to share. Yeah, what, did, what did you come to? For two, uh, I mean, what did you drive this morning? A Mercedes or a Maruti 800? Unfortunately, he was uh, driving a Lamborghini. That's a Lamborghini. Ali. Ah, see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get, we'll give you the details so of the course. We use okay. a cycle, Bob. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I know that. I've seen enough of Prashant's and your cycles, which are used. This is Renuka from Delhi. This is not. Oh, Renuka, Renuka. Yeah. Hi, hi, right. hi. We, we cycle. Okay. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. I I charge four thousand. In Delhi's nine... winter, you cycle. Yeah, yeah. Come and see. Okay, I'll I I charge four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine for a one month course, and we take twenty five students. It's Friday and Saturday, which goes on uh, for four weeks. That's eight sessions, 16 hours. Can the children of 16 years attend? 16 is fine. Not below. 16 okay. is fine. Please yeah. share the detail. Would be interested. My sure. son may be interested to join on. Sure. Sure. Ali, I'll thank send you his mobile number. Yeah. yeah thank you, Bijal. Thank you. And all the best for everybody. Wonderful program. Uh, thoroughly you. enjoyed. Actually, I'm traveling, uh, reaching Bangalore, but still I logged in. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you. Um, can we move to the vote of thanks now? I think we've had a wonderful session. Deepa? Yes, sure, Bijal. Um, I know we can't, just can't get enough of Bobby as it seems. <laughs> it is indeed my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks to Bobby Clemens. Bobby, what do I say? You've done it again. Let's give him a hand, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's what, been a joy. Thank you. What an impactful session it has been. And what a fantastic number attending it. We had 100 and that's the max. We maxed out and I had calls, uh, people asking me why they couldn't log in. So uh, ever so much, thank you, Bobby, for taking time off from your busy schedule and sharing your valuable uh, insight and tips with all of us. We all know your commitment to Roundtable. Yes, in fact, uh, our association and our friendship goes back to 30 years. You were the one who introduced us to uh, tabling. And uh, in all these years that I have known you, um, I have known you consistently to be an extremely positive upbeat and inspiring person. Thank you. Constantly motivating people to bring out their best. Uh, the best gift that one could give anyone is instilling confidence. And you do it for us time and again, be it writing or public speaking. In this session, Bobby, you have given us enough food for thought, and, uh, but we are hungry for more. 
And uh, on this note, shall I say that we will keep ruminating. And uh, if, um, if it goes well, we could have a session just for the office bearers and the 41ers of Tangent and club, uh, 41ers club uh, to do something which is uh, more practical for them to get on with their life of writing and public speaking. Thank you ever so much, Bobby, for sharing your time and your tips once again. Kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you all. It was a thank joy. you, Jeshi, for, for scheduling the session. call. Jeshi. Thank you, Jeshi. Jeshi, you're muted. Thank it you, was Robert. A pleasure, and I'm so glad that we could manage to get somebody like Robert, Robert on this call and have the session with us. Hi. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us. We've learned so many Hi. points. And while we think that we are good speakers, there's always more to learn. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to everyone to make time for things. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll be ending the meeting now. Thank you. Yes.